uh, chapter 12 this morning, and we're just going to hit this real quickly uh, because it's about the Passover, and this is where we are in Exodus, and next week, Scott Dingfelder, like I said, is going to be here, and he's going to show us the representation of Jesus in the Passover, and so he's going to go through all those correlations, and it's really awesome, so I'm just going to kind of uh, get us to this point, uh, because what's happened here is this is the next big milestone in the uh, history of Israel, and so uh, the exodus of the Israelites out of slavery uh, from e Egypt, and so this, this Passover event, it marks the release of Israel from Egypt, and so uh, we're going to review these, these major biblical events that have got us to this point. And so, if you remember, when we went through Genesis, there are four major events in the book of Genesis, and then there are four major people. And so we have a timeline here, and uh, the first major event is the creation of the universe and all it contains. And God did that in 4,000 B.C., about 6,000 years ago. Um, it says God created the heavens and the earth. And when it says heavens, it's not talking about His place where He resides, what we think of as heaven. He's talking about uh, the sky, the space, the area, like we call the stars heavenly beings uh, or heavenly uh, bodies, the stars, the sun, the moon. So God created this space, this area, a place to, for the physical, uh, a dimension maybe you want to call it. And then he created, it says the earth, meaning not the planet earth, but the material, the raw material, the the molecular structure, atomic structure, the building blocks of everything physical, even, even air, oxygen is made out of uh, atoms, right? Atomic structure. So everything's made out of that. So God creates, uh, in the very beginning, He creates this area to put everything. He creates everything, this raw material, forms it into the planets, the stars, the moon. Uh, then on this planet specifically, He forms the, the seas and the oceans, the plant life, uh, then the animals. And then mankind, he made Adam in his own likeness. Remember, God breath, breathed life into Adam. That was the spiritual component. Man was different than all the other animals. Uh, then he made Eve. And so, uh, and that brings us to the second major event, uh, the fall of man to sin. And I have two minutes later there. Uh, it's kind of a joke. I don't know how long it was, but we know she, uh, Eve didn't have a child yet. And so, and we know that everything being perfect, they had perfect functioning uh, reproductive systems, uh, there's no, you know, she probably would have had a baby nine months after they met or got married or whatever you want to say, uh, however long that lasts. But anyway, sometime before that, Lucifer fell in heaven. Lucifer was uh, a created angel, right? He was the head of the angels, and he said he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God, and God uh, said, well, he kind of contested with God. I'm going to be like you. I'm going to be you. And so God kind of said, well, see you later, you know. Let's see how you do. And kind of sent him to the earth and saying, give it a shot, but we'll see in the end, in the final judgment, who's God, who's the judge, and who gets, gets judged. So Satan and a third of the angels are on the earth in, in a spiritual sense here. They're around. And uh, Eve gets tempted uh, she gets deceived by, Ad, by Satan. And uh, remember, God gave them one rule. They could do anything they wanted. He said, don't eat the fruit of this one tree. And uh, that's it. And nothing's wrong with eating fruit. He said, eat any of the other fruit. But just this one fruit, it was just a rule. It was just a test. It wasn't about the fruit. It was about the, their mindset of what they are going to do with this rule. And Eve was deceived, and she ate the fruit. Adam chose to eat the fruit. And they, so they chose to disobey God. They chose to go against the Creator. The Creator, the boss, the, He's God, He's Master. He says, don't eat it. They say, I'm going to eat it. So they challenged His authority. They rebelled against God. In essence, just like Satan, they said, I'm going to be God of my life. I'm going to choose to do what I want to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. And they made themselves out to be God, and they have earned death by that. And, they'll be and, they're, and this judgment would come upon mankind. And we've all earned, we've all inherited that from Adam and Eve, and we've all proved it with ourselves. We've all sinned. So the next uh, major event is the judgment of man. And this is 1,600 years later, in 2,400 uh, B.C., with the worldwide flood, Noah's flood. And uh, it says the world, it says everyone in the world 
Their thoughts were evil continually, and that's how far man had digressed. Uh, and, but Noah found favor in God's eyes, Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and uh, their wives. And so he has Noah build this ark. God's going to judge the world with a worldwide flood, but he provides a way of salvation. He pro provides this ark. Uh, he instructs Noah to build. And Noah, it took 100 years, and Noah was preaching the whole time, but nobody listened. Nobody wanted to take advantage of that way of salvation, except for Noah and his sons and the, and the wives. And so he, they go on the ark, close it up, uh, the world gets judged. Uh, and uh, the ark settles down, they come out, God tells them to set, spread out throughout the earth, populate the earth, spread out. 200 years later, uh, only 200 years later, they didn't spread out. Uh, you know, maybe Noah, maybe they started out spreading out, but what happened was they all kind of stayed together. They didn't follow God's direction. And so what do they decide to do? They start building this tower to heaven. And, uh, you know, we have the advantage of flying in space and seeing that you can't get to heaven where God is in the physical. You can't get there, you know, from here like that physically. They didn't know that. They were thinking he was up in the clouds. And so their desire was to build a tower. You know, we don't need God to get to heaven. We'll build a tower and go work our way right up to heaven. We'll walk up to heaven. Same thing. We'll be God. We'll be our own God. We don't need God. We can build our own tower, our own ladder, right to heaven. We will be God. It's the same thing over again. And God this time doesn't destroy them, uh, but he, he confuses their language. He wants to stop it without killing them. So all of a sudden, they're all speaking different languages, and, and they can't communicate, and they all think, you know, the other people are crazy because they're all babbling in all these different languages. And, uh, and it's believed that they kind of grouped together, that some were, some were speaking French, some were speaking uh, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever, uh, English and the, the Asian languages, the uh, Inca and, and uh, American Indian, the, those different dialects, the African dialects, and people kind of found somebody, hey, we can communicate, and they kind of grouped together and they went off in different directions. And so it kind of, God kind of caused them to spread out, even though they didn't want to. And that's the explanation for the different races, because these groups of people, their genetics you know, these traits, different traits came out, skin colors and our different noses and shapes and all that that we have and hair colors all came out in these different groups. And that's where the, where the world got separated into nations. And so those are the four major events, creation of the universe, the fall of man to sin, the judgment of man with the flood and the separation of people into nations. Then there are four major people in the book of Genesis. About 300 years later, God raises up Abraham. So people are spread out now on the earth. God finds Abraham and he says, I want, you, I want to make a special people to myself. And I'm going to call you to leave your homeland and come to this land that I'm promising you, that I'm giving to you, the land of Canaan. And, this is, uh, and so Abraham follows. He takes a step of faith and he follows the Lord. He goes to a place where he couldn't look on Google Maps, right? He just goes to this place following God. He doesn't know what's there. He ends up there. God makes a covenant with him and says he's going to make a mighty nation out of Abraham and his descendants. Um, but Abraham didn't have any descendants because his wife, Sarah, was barren. She couldn't have children. And so uh, here they're still waiting. God just keeps telling them this promise, but she's getting old. They're both getting old. There's no kids. And so they decide, well, hey, uh, maybe we can help God out. You know, God's it's not coming through. It's not happening. Kind of, again, maybe we'll do it our way. And so they uh, get Sarah's maid, Hagar, and, uh, and get her to be a surrogate mother kind of thing. And Abraham goes into her, she gives birth to Ishmael. And so that's technically Abraham's firstborn. And, and God speaks to Abraham, and Abraham says, here, here he is, he's Ishmael. Here, I, I've made a son. And God says, no, that's not the one. I don't want the son you're going to provide. I want the son that I'm going to provide. And uh, he says, I, Sarah is going to have a child. And so about 10 years later, uh, Sarah becomes pregnant in her old age, 90 years old. Abraham's 100 years old and has Isaac, the promised son. Ishmael becomes the father of all the Arab nations. Trace their lineage back to Ishmael to Abraham. Jewish people trace their lineage through Isaac to Abraham. That is where this, this division goes back almost 4,000 years. And so um, you can see why Jimmy Carter or anybody going over there trying to talk peace between uh, the Arab nations and Israel. It's just, it's a long, long battle, and I don't know if it'll ever be resolved. 
until God comes back, Jesus comes back. So Isaac gives birth to, uh, he meets Rebekah. They get married. They have twins, uh, Ishmael, I mean uh, Esau and Jacob. Twins, right? Esau is the older. He comes out first, but he despises the special birthright of being the firstborn. He sells it to his brother Jacob for a bowl of stew, and uh, that's not what he thought of his birthright. And so Jacob, uh, who was kind of a deceiver and ends up getting deceived himself, remember he gets a, uh, he goes in to marry this Rachel, the, the woman of his dreams, and the father-in-law does a switcheroo in the, in the wedding chamber, and he ends up, wakes up in the morning with the wrong girl, the wrong bride. And so he ends up with uh, two wives, and then their two concubines, and they have 12 sons. And uh, Jacob, you remember, he wrestled with God, and God dislocated his hip, and that's a really cool, interesting story. Uh, he's known for that. And God changed his name to Israel. So Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and that's where the nation of Israel gets their name, through, through Jacob, through this son. He has 12 sons. Joseph is son number 11. He is, but he's the 11th son, but he's the firstborn of Rachel. That's the wife that, that Jacob really loved. He really had the heart for. Um, so he favored Joseph. Uh, he was his favorite. And the other the 12 older brothers didn't like it. They hated Joseph. They sold him into slavery, told the father he was dead. He ends up in Egypt, um, and he's, he ends up being a slave there. Then he ends up in prison. He's falsely accused. He goes through a difficult life as God's preparing him for what he wanted him to do. Uh, God then, uh, while he's in prison, God gives uh, Joseph the, uh, the ability, or God interprets dreams really through Joseph for other people. One of them happens to be the Pharaoh. Uh, and he has this dream, and there's going to be seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. Joseph interprets it, and, and uh, the Pharaoh says, man, that's awesome. And Joseph says, why don't you store up during these seven good years so you can get through the other ones? He said, great job, good idea. You be in charge of that. So Joseph ends up being number two in charge of all of Egypt. And um, so there's many years later, the dad thinks Joseph's dead. The brothers have, have no idea what happened. That Jacob, Israel, he sends his sons down for some food. They're going through this famine. They're starving to death. You know, maybe it had been a year. And, uh, and they go back and forth a few times, but Joseph finally reveals himself. Hey, I'm your brother. Go get dad. You guys move down here because we got like six more years of famine to get through. And so uh, they all move down to Egypt. And so that's how Israel, the dad, Jacob, and all his sons, they all end up in Egypt, this whole people group. The whole family, and uh, and they're there living there, and they get through the famine, and uh, and they keep on going, and that gets us uh, into Exodus. And so, um, what happens is the Pharaoh dies. The Pharaoh really liked Joseph. Well, he dies. The next guy comes along, and the Israel, the people of Israel, were multiplying so fast and growing so fast. He was afraid they were going to take over. He was threatened by them, so he makes slaves out of them. He puts this whole race of people into slavery, into bondage. And so for 400 years, they were there 430 years total, but for 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. And, uh, and so God, you know, 80 years before this 430 years are up, raises up Moses. And Moses is born, uh, and the, the Pharaoh's daughter ends up raising Moses as her own, like a, a stepchild or adopted son. Um, for 40 years, Moses was raised in the, in the house of Israel, I mean the house of Egypt. Then he uh, makes a stand for his people. He gets exiled from Egypt for another 40 years. God uses him in this little desert town of Midian. He's raising sheep, God preparing him uh, to lead the people out. When he's 80 years old, uh, in 1500 BC, God raises up Moses, asks Moses to go. He doesn't want to go, remember? And he kind of goes reluctantly. Uh, and last time we went through, so he goes back to Egypt. He says, hey, God says release the Israelites. We, we want to go back to the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised us. And uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh says, you know, no, that ain't going to happen. So he says, okay, God's going to bring a plague. Remember, we went through all those plagues. And so he keeps going back after every plague. Are you going to release the people? No, I'm not. And the next plague comes, and we went through all those. And so the 10th plague is here in chapter 12. And so we're going to read through this real quickly. And, uh, and like I said, next week, Scott's going to really bring to life uh, Jesus 
as an example. Remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And so as we read through this, think about that. Jesus rep is the Lamb represented here. And so I'm going to take my glasses off to read. I don't know why. Crazy. And uh, so follow along here in Exodus chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbors nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Remember, unleavened bread, leavened is yeast, and God uh, uses Yeast is a symbol of sin. Yeast isn't always bad. He's not against us eating bread. But at this time, he wants them to eat unleavened bread. Because, and the reason he uses it to signify sin is because it spreads so fast. It, uh, just a little bit of yeast in the dough will, will work its way throughout the dough really rapidly. And we see that uh, in sin. We see that in, the, in, in our lives, in the, in the history of the world, how sin just spread throughout people so rapidly. And so God uses this as an example. So, so keep that in mind. He wants them to have unleavened bread, bitter herbs. And Scott's going to get way more into that, like I said. Then in verse 9, he says, do not eat any of the raw or any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its heads and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn it with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner. With your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So he's saying, be ready. Uh, you know, have your running pants on, your, your, your tennis shoes on, laced up, your staff in hand. Be ready to go, because this is going to happen tonight, he's telling them. We're not going to have time to fool around uh, packing, getting dressed, and all that. You need to be ready. Verse 12, for I will go throughout the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord, God says. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So here it is again, God's judgment, God judging this land of Egypt, and God makes a way of salvation. And that way of salvation was the blood of this lamb. And they would mark the door on the outside. They do the header and the doorpost to mark what has happened inside, that this sacrifice has taken place. And uh, you remember last week we talked about, there was a, in uh, Romans chapter 10, there's this inward belief and there's an outward expression of that. And this represents that outward expression of their belief. And just like in our lives, there's an outward expression of our belief. Uh, it's the blood. It's the blood of Jesus that's, that's the outward of expression that should be seen in us. So he continues in verse 14. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it at a, as a permanent ordinance. So it's this one-time event, but then God's telling him, you just keep on uh, doing re reenactments. He's not going to keep killing Israel, uh, Egyptians every time, but it's just this reacting, uh, the react, reenactment, like we do with the Civil War around here, uh, just so they remember what happened. So in verse 15, he says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your house. Whoever eats anything leavened from this first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread 
For on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened in your dwellings. You shall, not, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some to the door that some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil, so that's like the header over the door, and then the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. And so he says, stay in, don't go out. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in your houses and to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, he has promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, so this is why he wants them to keep doing it. When your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice. The Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. And so remember, God, these people didn't do anything. They weren't righteous. God told them to sacrifice this lamb, that's a representation of Jesus, and put the blood on. I'll do this outward expression so I can see that you believe, that you follow this. And, and God passed over their judgment. It wasn't anything they did. They weren't, uh, it wasn't because they were law-abiding citizens, because they did, were you know, so good, because they read their Bible every day or prayed every day. It was just because they believed God that God would pass over, and he did. Verse 28, Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, captive who was in the dun dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. So it didn't matter who you were, the firstborn died. It said, Pharaoh arose in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. Verse 33, The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. So they're like, get out of here. You know, we're tired of these plagues. Now all these people are dead. Please, please leave, they're asking the, the people of Israel. And so the people took their dough before it was leavened, the Israelites, and uh, with their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. And so they just grabbed everything and they're heading out of town. Now we're told in verse 35, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. Remember Moses told them, you ask the people for these things before you leave. They ask the Egyptians to give you this stuff. And, uh, and it says in verse 36, And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of Egyptians so that they, so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And this is so awesome. They they plundered the Egyptians, but it was a voluntary plunder. They, they, handed the, they just gave the stuff over. It wasn't at gunpoint. They just asked for it. You know, our God is so cool. Uh, he works in so many awesome ways. Verse 37, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. 600,000 men. With women and children, we think it's about 3 million people. Uh, this people group leaving Egypt. This is a big group of people. And it says in verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them along with flocks and herds. 
a very large number of livestock. And so this mixed multitude is believed that these were some Egyptians that believed, that, that followed. Maybe they went through the Passover sacrifice as well. Maybe they lost a firstborn and they said, man, this is God. And remember the whole point of God doing these signs, these plagues, was to show himself. Not, not just to show himself to the people of Israel, but to show himself to the world, to the Egyptians, that he is the God, that they are not gods. And so he says in verse uh, 39, they baked the dough with which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Verse 42, it, it, it is a night to be observed for the Lord. And listen to that. It is a night to be observed for the Lord. For the Lord. This is like a holiday setting up. It's for the Lord. It's not necessarily for the people. It's to show the people, show the children what happened. But this is to be observed for the Lord. For having brought them out of the land of Egypt, this night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house. In other words, don't, don't bring any of the leftovers home. You need to finish this thing off. Eat the whole lamb, or it says burn it with fire, right? Nor are you to break any bone of it. All the con Remember Jesus, none of his bones were broken. Uh, and I, it's, again, Scott's going to go through all these. I just have to point out some of them because they're so awesome. Man. It's so cool. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, uh, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near to celebrate it, and he shall be like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. Then all the sons of Israel did so. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on the same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. And so praise God, another example of God uh, bringing judgment on man, but pro providing a way of salvation from that judgment. And uh, just what a, what a neat thing how God has, has worked over the years and continues to work in us. And so if you can make it next week, I hope you come. Uh, let's pray real quick. Lord, we just thank you for being who you are and such an incredible God and working in such magnificent ways through uh, all these people, your servants, people that serve you and working with people that refuse you like the Pharaoh, Lord. And I just ask that you would help us to be the people that serve you, Lord. Give us that desire in our hearts. Uh, as Kara uh, mentioned earlier, Lord, that we would just, we would lay down that old life, Lord, and that we would follow you. And we know we're not perfect. We know we're going to make mistakes. And you use those mistakes and you build us up because it's you doing the work not us. And Lord, we just thank you for that. And so help us to remember that as we go out this week, that you're not going to call us to do anything that you're not willing to do through us if we would just let you do it. Lord, we thank you for being our God. We just ask for your blessing on us this week. Amen.